I'm going to invite our friends at BDO. So BDO um, are, are great supporters of Farm Management Canada. They're sponsoring this next session. And so um, it's called, you know, New Benchmarks for Canadian Agriculture. So we've been working with BDO and Larry Martin and his team um, for the past few years. And we're excited to kind of see uh, what's come of rethinking financial statements, rethinking the way that we can compare apples to apples and uh, and and kind of work on benchmarking and, and how we're measuring up. Um, so we've got Maggie Van Camp, National Agricultural Practice Development Leader at BDO. What a great title is that? And then I'm not <laughs> going to introduce the other speakers too thoroughly because I know Maggie's going to do that, but we have Larry Martin um, from Agri-Food Management Excellence. We've got Lisa Kemp, partner with Agriculture Industry Lead and BDO, and Matt Penner, um, Senior Manager of the Pembina branch of BDO. So without further ado, I will uh, throw it over to the team at BDO. Thanks so much. Welcome to the bench parking presentation. Um, when I reviewed the the uh, slides that everyone was going to present, I thought we should actually rename this to Unlocking the Power of Your Farm Numbers, because that's exactly what they're going to do today. Benchmarking is simply a way to compare and give you insights and ways to improve on your farm performance. And we've been doing it. Farmers have been doing this forever. I mean, coffee shop, yield talk. Uh, I remember my dad actually pouring himself over the Holstein Journal, comparing the production of bull, bull daughters to his own herd and how to make breeding selections around that. So benchmarking has basically been used for production uh, with small data historically, so it's been somewhat unreliable. But as we saw in Casper's presentation, we've, we're entering the data decision era. And financial benchmarking is going to take your decision making to the next level, tying operational decisions with profitability. And these benchmarks that, that BDO has put together for you today are, contain a lot of data, so they're very reliable and they're very meaningful. And we're going to dig into that. They objectively can give you some idea of your performance and see what's working well and where to improve. It's basically like a gateway drug to better business planning. I'm Maggie Van Camp. I'm live from Guelph, Ontario. I'm joined today, as, as uh, Heather said, with Dr. Larry Martin. He's in Cambridge. Lisa Kemp, who's a farmer and accountant in Lindsay, Ontario, is joining us. And Matt Penner, an accountant, and I like to call him our benchmarking maverick from Winkler. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Larry, so much for joining us today. And I, I'm it's my pleasure to actually introduce you uh, this morning. And uh, we're gonna have 15 minutes for each of the presenters. And then everybody put in your, your questions. You can put them right into the Q&A session. And at the end, we'll, we'll open it up for that. Um, just to give you a bit of a rundown, Larry's gonna do an explanation of what the benchmarking ratios are and how to use them. Then Lisa's gonna give us a sneak peek into what uh, the benchmarks are telling us about Canadian agriculture today. And then Matt's gonna roll up his sleeves and dive into a spreadsheet and actually show you how benchmarks can help real farmers plan for the future. So let's get started. Uh, Larry Martin is a former professor of agriculture economics uh, at the University of Guelph. In fact, he was a professor when I was there in the late 80s, early 90s. And we were all somewhat terrified of Larry because he was so brilliant and a fantastic speaker. He then was involved with the George Morris Center and started C-Team, which is basically an MBA for farmers. And then he became principal of the Agri-Food Management Excellence, uh, which they do training with programs like the C-Team and Farm Your Numbers. Three years ago, Larry was inducted into the Canadian Agriculture Hall of Fame for his lifelong work helping farmers use financial man management and for his work on the benchmarks. So without any further ado, Larry, do you wanna start? Yes, I'm ready to start, thank you. I hope I'm ready to start, here we go. <laughs> I think that should do it. Boy, that was quite an introduction, Maggie. I got a lot to live up to here. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much. And it's great to be with you all. Um, I looked at the list of uh, people who are 
uh, <clears throat> viewing this, and I think I know a lot of people out there. So uh, good to see all of you, or or see your names anyway out there. So. Um, my job is twofold here, as Maggie said. One, I want to talk about where the benchmarks came from that we and that we and and uh, BDO put together uh, together, I guess. And then secondly, I want to illustrate some ways that I find them useful in management and planting planning. Uh, <clears throat> I need to say that in the 15 minutes we have available, I think we're going to touch the surface on this because, to my mind, there's I just keep finding ways that these things are useful. But we'll we'll give you at least. Uh, a good start here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So where'd the benchmarks come from? At the very inception, uh, it started from our C team program that uh, my partner, my business partner, uh, Heather Broughton and I uh, put on through our company, AME. Everyone who has ever taught the financial management component of C team focuses on the management information that farmers have in their financial statements if they know how to use it. Uh, and we'll say a little bit about that here. But uh, we we kind of had the idea it would be even more powerful if we had quantitative benchmarks that reflect the mo what the most profitable farms achieve. So that that kind of got us started in the conversation with Jim Snyder when he had Maggie's job at VDO um, a, a few years ago, and and that and that led us into the process. Uh, from there, that question of where they came from has a three-part answer. Number one, it comes from the financial management uh, literature. Any basic presentation on financial management will tell you that income statements and balance sheets give four types of ratios that are useful in management. We have operating ratios, which come off the income statement. We have liquidity ratios, which come off the balance sheet, solvency ratios that come off the uh, income and balance sheets, and profitability ratios that come off the income and balance sheets. Liquidity and solvency are probably pretty much the standard for most types of businesses with a few variations. Profitability is kind of a performance thing at the end. The operating ratios is where there's lots of variation among different types of, farm, of firms. And so that's the basis for our benchmark. That's the first part of the basis for our benchmarking process. The second part comes from being having a standard income statement. In order to compare among businesses, because what you're going to end up doing is comparing your farm or an individual farm to a, to a benchmark that comes from a group, you got to be able to compare apples to apples. Okay? Apples and oranges don't work in this thing. So, uh, so a fundamental requirement is to have a standard structure to the farm's income statement. And uh, that's something that actually people have been calling for for my whole career, which is more than a couple of days long, I'll tell you. Um, and we finally got uh, some of the accountants at BDO to finally agree to actually standardize the statement. So here's how we standard. Here's how we set up the standard operating statement. Um, it's it's basic. It's ordered in or it's organized into logical categories. And on the cost side, is based on two principles. First, managing operations is different than managing capital and finances, and that and that's we split it out on the basis of that, as I'll show you in a minute. And the second principle is that all farms, no matter what commodities they produce, have five standard sets of cost, three of which are operating, two of which are capital. Okay, so going to the next step uh, go, uh, to say more about the way we standardize the statement. Uh, number one, it needs to be done with an accrual statement. It, it, the cash statement doesn't work. Uh, you gotta, gotta have the accrual. Uh, on the revenue side, what we do include <clears throat> is the sales of the products that the farm produces, crop insurance claims, custom work, change in product inventory. It does not include government payments other than crop insurance, obviously. It does, it does not in include gain or loss on disposal of assets, investment income, non-farm income and expenses and so forth. They are included to get down to your income tax, but at the end of the statement under other income and expenses. Here are the five cost categories. The three operating cost categories are, and these are the names we've given them. It doesn't matter what you call them, but we call the first one cost of goods sold. Uh, that's uh, what that it is to me is the material that you buy that you transform into a final product. So that we seed, fertilizer, chemicals for crops, feed, feeder animals, medicines, uh, for uh, animals and, uh, and then crop insurance premiums also go in that category. <clears throat> the second category is direct, what we call direct operating expenses. And it has three components to it, the cost of operating machinery and equipment, 
the cost of shipping and receiving, and your labor costs. The third category is operating overheads, which are, which are kind of non uh, quasi variable costs, professional fees, office rents, and utilities if you have them, promotional fees, bank charges, uh, and things like that. The capital cost categories fall are two. So two. One is depreciation and amortization, but we also include in this rents uh, for land and machinery, leasing costs, and land carrying costs, and so forth. Uh, this puts all of the capital cost into one category. Uh, so we don't have operating, have, we don't have leasing costs up in the operating category for farms that, uh, that lease machinery and, and, and depreciation and the capital one for those who own machinery, put them all in one place. And it's very much in line with the new international financial reporting system. Uh, and then obviously the last category of cost is the interest cost. So we would have interest on short and term, long-term loans. And if you can do it, uh, break out the interest on leases. So those are the categories. It ends up giving us an operating statement that looks like this. So we have revenue from farming. We subtract off of that the cost of goods sold. That gives us gross margin. We subtract off of that direct operating expense. Um, that gives us what we call contribution margin. We subtract off of that the operating overheads. That gives us EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And I put an R in there because in, actually the account, some of the accounting uh, folks uh, say it's also before rental and lease costs, uh, which it, it certainly is. Then we take off the depreciation and lease and rental costs. That gives us EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. Um, and, that subtract, and we subtract off of that the interest expenses, which gives us earnings before taxes from operations. And then that other income and expenses goes in. But when we're doing the analysis for any farm and when we're doing the analysis for the benchmarks, those categories that you see outlined in dark are the ones that we use and our ratios are basically taking each category and dividing them by the revenue from farming um, at the top at the, the very top so it's a, as expressed as a percentage of revenue <clears throat> so uh, the last point about where they came from is that uh, we uh, video then took that that framework and organized the uh, farm data into that framework uh, profitability ratios are calculated by type of farm and location to obtain good sample size. It was all done anonymously. Um, and the, and what we did with the benchmarks is in, we, is the average of the 25% most profitable in a group. So I'm going to use an example from the last one I worked on, which we from 19 or 2019 data. Uh, and that's from Manitoba cash, uh, cash grain and oil seed farms. Lisa's going to talk about a, a more recent update. Uh, in this sample, we had 1,776 total farm records. So our benchmark is the average of the top 25%, which is 44, 444 farms. <clears throat> so these are the benchmarks from that group. Uh, so as, you know, we start with all the revenue is 100%. So those top 25% farms actually spent 30% of their revenue on the categories of cost that are in the cost of goods sold. Subtract that off from the revenue and that leaves 70% for gross margin. <clears throat> their direct operating expenses were 17%. Subtract that off, that means we got 53% left uh, for contribution margin. Operating overheads were three and a half percent. So that means that EBITDA, which is another way of saying operating in earnings, were just about 50% of sales. So after paying all of your operating costs, the, the, the most profitable farms had 50 cents left over of every dollar of sales. Then we deduct the capital cost, um, which is the depreciation, leasing, and so forth. That amounted to 17%, giving us 32.5% for EBIT earnings before interest and taxes. And the last category was that just a tad over 1% uh, on average of, of, of revenue was, uh, was spent on interest costs for those farms. Okay, so now how do we, how would, how do we talk about this and what, what's, it, what's the value of it? Uh, but to get there, I wanna say first a couple of things about a, a couple of cautions that we've learned, that I've learned anyway in working with this stuff. Number one, there is not one set of benchmarks for all farms. I like. I like to start with the grain ones, the grain and oil seed ones, because most farmers have some concept of what it's like to be doing something with a grain and oil seed enterprise. But 30 seconds of reflection reveals that a beef feedlot will not have a 70% gross margin. 
if they're buying feeder cattle and feed and so forth. There's no way you can have a 70% gross margin. So it's gotta be different for that. Similarly, almost every horticultural operation I've ever worked with have a higher gross margin, but they also have much higher direct operating expenses because of their labor component. Okay, so again, it, why, why would you expect all types of farms to have the same benchmarks. You can't. Um, a few more seconds of re reflection, frankly, will give you very good guidance for how you might adjust the benchmarks for different types of farms. And we can talk about that in the question period if you'd like. So that's the first thing to understand. Second thing is that when, I, when I'm working with a farm or, or if I, work, I see a farm manager working with it, your first task is to always understand if your ratios are off, what's the context? Why are they off? Is it a management issue or is it some other factor? So for example, I had some friends in Saskatchewan last year who had a, a very large lentil crop, which they lost all of. Well, guess what? They don't have a 70% gross margin. And, and that's nothing to do with their management, it has everything to do with their location and weather. Uh, I've also been in a situation where I, I looked at the data and a farmer, a, a farmer had just bought a new farm and a bunch of new equipment, put it in this year's expenses, but had no revenue from that farm uh, until next year. So guess what? Their capital costs more than 17%. As soon as we figured that out, well, okay, this is not a management issue. This is just a timing issue. And so there's lots of these things that you, uh, I think you always need to understand what the context is before you start interpreting them. Okay, so now here's how I kind of think about it from the perspective of the uh, of understanding what the value is here. Um, uh, I've got three examples I trumped up here, and, uh, and I'm sorry I used the word trump there advisedly. Uh, but if you look at the bottom line, our most profitable farms had 31.4 percent of their net earnings or the net or of their sales were net earnings. If you look across at the other three I've got here. Um, you, you can see that there's a wide variation. If, and in fact, on a million dollars of sales, uh, the, that's, that's a difference of, uh, it's basically 90 to $140,000 that those other farms are leaving on the table that the best farms are actually uh, taking off the table. Um, so if we go back up and look at the numbers, uh, and, and each farm kind of explains why they are off. So farm one, is uh, has a, has the issue of the cost of goods sold. Now, the interesting thing about this, if you're off on this number, there's only three things that be, can cause, cause it. And this is what I really like about this because it helps you pinpoint where the issues are. The three things that are gonna cause you to be off are number one, your, grain, your selling prices for your product are, too, are lower than they should be, your yields are lower than they should be, or your cost of, of inputs are higher than they should be. So you can go back behind this uh, into some of the benchmarks and say, okay, where's my issue here? And I'm beginning to understand what to do with it. Farm two has a 26% direct operating expenses. Again, there's only three things here. One, one is the cost of labor, one's the cost of running your machinery and equipment, one's, one's the cost of transportation. We can go back behind it and say, where's the issue? The farm three has their issues down below on cost of capital, okay? Their cost of capital is much higher and, and they bar obviously borrowed a bunch of money and they've got a higher, uh, interest cost. Okay, so what this tells me from a strategic perspective is Farm Three has way more assets than they need to have for the amount of sales. They need to generate more. Either they either need to generate more sales uh, from those assets, or they need to sell some assets. One of the, one of those two things. So, uh, as a final as a final uh, um, uh, kind of point on this, uh, my generalizations at least are at least these three things. Understanding these numbers and how your numbers reflect or, or, or compare to them are number one, allow you to pinpoint exactly where you have a problem. Okay, number two, it gives focus for future planning and investment. So let's take that first farm. If, they're, if their issue is their, their selling prices are too low, most likely, and this is what I see happening all the time with farms, I'm gonna have a strategic intent in my, in my plan of being able to improve my marketing ability. And so what am I gonna do about it and so forth? So it helps you with planning and investment uh, in many cases. And then obviously as a corollary of both of those things, it can help you pinpoint your goals and, and help you measure whether you've reached them and whether you're making improvements or not. Okay, Maggie, I'm, I'm finished with that. So it's, I, can, I can move on, you can move on. 
Thanks, Larry. I just uh, want to thank you so much for being here today. Um, we were really concerned about three weeks ago, I got a little email from Larry saying he had a snag uh, that he was in the hospital and then suddenly he's getting heart surgery and we were so worried about it. So thank you. I'm very glad you've recovered and uh, we'll look forward to answering some of the questions at the very end. I've got a couple for you in the in the Q&A box already. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, yeah, thanks. So next up is Lisa Kemp. Uh, you can see her presentation on the left. She is uh, the benchmarking lead for BDO Agriculture Canada, and she's a partner in the BDO office in Lindsay, Ontario. She's been instrumental in getting those standardized financial statements that Larry talked about into all our, our offices across Canada. And she comes with a sort of practical get it done attitude because she is actually uh, a farm a farmer as well. So her family farms uh, beef, they have grain and oil seeds, and they just are starting into the chicken business in the new year. So she comes with sort of uh, a very practical attitude. And she has a Bachelor of Science of Agriculture from the uh, University of Guelph and is, of course, uh, a CPA as well. She's going to talk about the results of the new benchmarking. Uh, we're putting out some reports in January and you can actually see in the chat box, the URL to click on to register to get them for free. Uh, you can pre-register to get them so they'll just come to your inbox. Um, and she's gonna tell us what's happening based on those numbers on Canadian farms across Canada. So welcome Lisa. Thanks Maggie. So our goal has been um, to help Canadian farmers understand where they stand financially um, and the impact decisions can have on profitability of your businesses. Uh, our standardized financial statements, so again, they're based on the framework that Larry just discussed. Um, and then the way we can benchmark introduces understanding and context to take operations to the next level. Our goal is to have you not leaving your accountants and filing your statements in a drawer, but rather using the information as a tool and unlocking the power of your financial statements and helping make better decisions. The information you get out of a tool like this is only as good as the data that goes into it. So since we internally control all the data accumulated and it's prepared using consistent processes, we have strong confidence in the quality of the numbers. Over the past several years, we've added data from more production years and added more geographical regions to our sample. We found that the numbers are extremely consistent and stable, and this consistency gives us assurance that we have it right. This tool will help you understand the strengths and weaknesses of your own operation and identify opportunities to increase margins. So as Larry said, you need to watch the context before you start interpreting the numbers. Um, if yields are affected by weather in a given year or a new investment's been made that hasn't had a chance uh, to impact revenue yet, the ratios can be unrepresentative of, of your farm's performance. So in general, we always look at three to five years of data. And when we look at our clients' numbers over a five-year period, we see, our, we see clear trends and consistent margins. And once you understand your own margins and trends, the next step is to compare it to similar producers. The real value in this analysis isn't just in looking at any particular ratio, but in the deeper understanding of your farm's financial performance and the discussions and analysis that drive from those numbers. Our reporting helps you make informed decisions based on your actual numbers. So this is a summary of the average operating income ratio for all types of Canadian farms from PEI to Alberta over the last five years. It does reflect bad weather in the 2019 crop year um, across the West and many parts of Ontario, but all the ratios are fairly consistent year over year, reflecting the quality of the data and the overall stability of Canadian agriculture. Uh, what we see over here on average um, is that operating incomes around 28% of revenue, or you have $280,000 of operating income for every million dollars of revenue base that an operation might have. Uh, the average farm's operating income ratio has slipped slightly over the last five years and overall net incomes now 2% below the five year average. This is an interesting chart showing the continued overarching impact costs of capital are having on the industry and subsequent vulnerability. So the orange bars um, are your operating income percentage or the percentage of revenue you have left over after paying all your operating expenses. 
uh, and the blue line shows the capital cost. So as Larry said, this includes rent, property taxes, uh, amortization, lease payments, uh, interest on your debt. And you can see in the graph, the cost of capital consumes most of the income uh, that operations are generating. So capital costs in farm businesses are significant um, and managing that's imperative to the health of Canada's farms. The spread between the two lines is, is your bottom line or your net income before other items. And that's the income you're gonna have available to fund your principal obligations and, and invest in growth. So a little bit on cash flow. When we look at your operating income in dollars and compare that to the payment requirements on your debt, that gives your debt service capacity. Developing an understanding and understanding your cash flow plan is key to running a successful operation and should be an essential part of your business plan. This allows you to take on new opportunities and make informed purchase decisions. In one of Larry's publications, he used the quote, cash is king. And he analyzed a ratio that compared operating income of an operation to the level of debt that it carries. It's important to remember there are two parts to this ratio, the level of debt and operating income available. The amount of debt an operation can handle is a function of your own efficiency, and the level of debt only becomes an issue if there isn't enough cash to service it. So you need to use your own actual numbers to do this analysis. Um, as we'll see on the next slide, there's varying levels of operating efficiency within sectors of Canadian agriculture, and Larry just gave you a few examples of that as well. Um, what's interesting as well is that we see in our data as much variance in a specific uh, commodity as we do um, across sectors. And so what I mean by this is there's significant variance when I compare an efficient dairy operation to a less efficient dairy operation. And we also see consistencies um, in, the, in the ratios when we get down to operating income, when we compare a top performing cash crop operation as an example to a top performing dairy um, operation. So these are some of our recent numbers uh, for Western Canada grain and oilseed farmers. Um, and you see we present the revenues both, or the numbers both as a percentage of revenue and also on a per acre basis. Uh, you can see top producers uh, have the highest uh, revenue per acre, as well as the lowest cost per acre in, in all categories actually. Um, the top one third of producers had 44% of its revenue base or $219 per acre available to fund capital costs. Um, in Ontario, interestingly, uh, the percentage is actually exactly the same at, at 44%. Um, but when, when we look at it on a dollar per acre basis, uh, it's higher in Ontario, which is relative to the higher cost of capital in Ontario compared to um, parts of the West. So the key with that is it, it, you got to know your, act, your actual numbers. So crop budgeting tools are useful only to the extent that you then tie them back to what your actual numbers were and they reflect your actual cost of production. So this chart um, shows some dairy numbers and it's showing numbers down to operating income for Canada's dairy farms and compares average to both the top and bottom third of producers rated on profitability. And you can see in this chart that there's significant variances between the efficiency of Canadian dairy producers. So there's not a set um, per kilogram amount of debt that, that every operation can handle. Your operating efficiency is, is really key. This is just the same information kind of in a, in a picture. These graphs show our analysis for dairy farms and the spread between top and average profitability. Controlling costs is essential for our, all farms, but for supply managed farms, it's paramount. Prices are set um, and quota limits production volume. So you have little control over revenues. What we see in the top dairy farms is that they're constantly finding ways to be more efficient and trim cross, costs across the board um, in, in almost every cost category, including feed, obviously, um, top farmers spend less to produce a kilogram of milk. So when you see this, this 15% spread here between top and average in profitability, just to quantify that with an operation of a million, with a million dollar gross revenue um, base, those top producers have $150,000 more every year to cover their costs of capital and invest in the future of their operation. And the picture of this gap is actually similar across both Ontario and Western uh, grain farmers.
A final point that was evident in the studies that we did is that the largest farms are not necessarily the most profitable. And we see where operations are efficient to a certain point and then margins may start slipping. And maybe it'll just take time as operations grow and management adjust to realign profitability. We want to continue to look into this further and, and see how do operations find their sweet spot. With equipment and land prices so high, strong managers ensure that they are utilizing assets to the best of their ability. Um, strength in farm management makes a big difference in profitability. And producers that have numbers below their local benchmarks are well served to focus first on getting good rather, rather than focusing on getting bigger. So just to kind of summarize, um, our benchmarks can unlock the power of your own numbers, um, focus on, help you focus on areas to improve and help you plan for the future. Deeper analysis can show our clients how small changes can make big impacts to your bottom lines. And the real power of these benchmarks is the conversations and strategies they instigate. When comparing individual results to overall benchmarks, it's important to understand that it's not about judging, it's about putting results into context and showing insights and, and having better discussions. So I'll transfer it back to you, Maggie, now uh, to introduce Matt. Great, thanks, thanks, Lisa, I like that. It's not a competition. Benchmarking is not a competition. Yeah, the, I know personally when I went through these that uh, for my farm that it was seeing the five-year trends where the big aha moments came for me just looking at my own farm. And that was really an interesting. So uh, now I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Matt Penner. Matt is a CPA and he's a senior man, a manager in our BDO Pembina Valley office, which is in Southern Manitoba. He helped create the original templates and help build these benchmarks out. And he's gonna take us through an example and show us uh, some data comparisons, how objective decisions have been made on real farms and show us uh, how red flags and the financial statements can be used. So Matt. Yeah, I just had to unmute myself. It wouldn't be a, a webinar or an online webinar in this new environment if I didn't have to uh, stumble for the mute button. Um, so we're gonna jump right into some actual numbers. I think you guys can see my screen right now. Maggie, you can, you can see my screen? Okay, awesome. Um, so this is a tool that we use for benchmarking with all of our clients. And like Maggie said, I'm from Southern Manitoba. We've been reviewing this data with clients for the last three years and it's expanded across Canada now, which we're very excited about. But the tool that we use is, is built in Excel. And um, basically what I'm gonna take you through is a sample farm here. Uh, it's about a 3,600 acre farm, a grain and oil seed farm. And like uh, Larry and, and Lisa talked about, the data is, is on an accrual basis. So when we're looking at the year over year numbers, we're looking at what the, the farm would have realized um, by selling all of their crop for the values that they put on it at the end of the year in inventory. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so we'll start with looking at the income statement. Now this is, there's, I always talk to clients up front that there's a lot of numbers on this page, um, but there's certain ones that we wanna focus on. The gray columns here, they represent our local benchmark. So in the Pemina Valley, um, our area that we're covering is, is uh, central Southern Manitoba. And uh, so these benchmarks represent about 75 to 100 farms from that area. And we filter out farms that have skewed the data uh, because you know maybe they've got a, you know, a strange situation or, or a crop share or something that's really messing with the, with the benchmark. So we've, we've really focused on uh, the variability in the data and the standard deviation. Um, the tool here is really great because it allows us to be interactive with, with the data. So while I've got a lot of data on here, I'm gonna actually filter it down here and we're just gonna look at the per acre numbers. So I'm gonna take off the actual numbers and we're gonna look at the per acre numbers and I'm gonna throw a yearly benchmark on there and also a average uh, average benchmark so you can see that. So the numbers will update here and now we're looking at per acre numbers. So these last two columns are the five-year average and I think that's very important because like Larry talked about and, and Lisa mentioned it as well, in any given year there's a lot of variability when we're looking at farm revenue, you know, you have a hailstorm or, or some other disaster and, and it wipes out your farm revenue and suddenly all your ratios are off. But looking at the five-year average really gives a farm an idea of what they're capable of. And like Lisa said, it's important to look at your own numbers and, and looking at that 
average helps you compare your numbers um, to the benchmark and see where you can improve. So Larry went through what's included in revenue, so I won't double up on that. But again, this revenue represents, when we're looking at the 2020 data here, because this is a January year end, this, this represents their 2019 crop sales. Uh, so any inventory they have on hand at January 31st, this represents the value that they would receive if they sold it for that value. Um, again, it doesn't include things like the agri stability payments or, or um, agri invest or uh, other income. But in this particular farm, you can see their, their five year average, they're generating $533 an acre and the benchmark is about 515, 518. And so they're really, you know, they're on par. And again, there's some variability here depending on what crops they're growing. Uh, so, you know, you always, we always talk to farmers specifically about that. There may be a reason why they're a little higher or lower than the benchmark. Uh, cost of goods sold in this particular case, it's fertilizer, chemical, and seed are the main, main items there. You can see here in the current year, they're actually right in line with the benchmark at $187 an acre, but on a five-year trend, they're about 20 to $25 higher than the benchmark. Um, we also view this data visually as part of the gross margin uh, chart here. Hey, Matt. So here. Yep. Sorry, this is Heather just jumping in. We're getting some reports that um, the screen's not changing as you're talking about different bits and pieces. It's still on the the main screen that you shared, the financial benchmarks, October 1st, 2020, oh, um, at the top of the screen. So not sure if you can, uh, can maybe to, reload that in or... <laughs> yeah, I can try to unload my, or take it off here and then put it back on, let's see. Maybe unshare and share. And thanks everyone for the, for the warnings. Um, I have a couple questions. We can just, well, Matt's doing that and we can cut, make sure we get um, all the questions answered. This one is for Larry. Um, and the question is, um, crop insurance has a subsidy component, so why not keep it with government revenue? Yeah, that's, a, I saw that question. It's an interesting one. Um, uh, and the answer is it, the argument is that it's risk, it's a risk management tool and therefore it should go in as revenue. Uh, the, pro the problem is exactly what the, what the questioner has pointed out. Yes, there's a subsidy component to it. So the question is, what do you do? It's one of those things in my, in my view, and it's, it's, it's one of the reasons we could never get to a standard function before or sta statement before because people couldn't agree on anything. In my view, you have to make a decision and go on. Uh, and, and that's the decision we made. I, I think on, there's, more, there's more legitimacy to that than there is to the subsidy part. And that's why we made the decision. But this goes on and on. I mean, there's always been an argument should, should property taxes be a capital cost or should be an overhead cost? Well, I, I brought that up to a farmer one day and he said, that's a stupid question. It's such <laughs> a small part of my expenditures. Why are you spending any time on it? Make a decision and keep it that way. And, and let's get to the important part. And that's kind of where okay. we are with that one. All right, Matt, you ready to go again? Yeah, I'm just loading it up here. Let's see if awesome. this works. That's great. Um, also, Larry, you can answer this question in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, one percent for interest costs seems low, given yeah. the large amount of debt uh, on some farms, and not only Western Canada but across Canada. I can tell you that it surprised me too, and and, and it it obviously comes down to this the sample. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and it's one of the, I to me it's one of those contexts again. It's a it's a really big one. If you are starting out or you're expanding and so forth, you're probably going to have a whole lot more debt than that. Uh, if you've been in business for a long time and you got lots of equity and so forth, then you're probably not going to have a lot of debt. So, uh, and a lot and, and a lot of capital costs. So, I, I th it's, it's to me, it's one of those ones. Uh, yeah, th that seems pretty low, and maybe five percent seems really high. But, it, but your in your context, five percent might be just exactly right. So, I think to me, it's a it's a stage of operation argument. Lisa, do you want to answer anything in that one percent for interest rates? Uh, yeah, I think just the same as what Larry said, right? We have to remember there's in the sample, there's highly leveraged farms. There's also farms that don't have uh, any any debt. So, yeah. Okay. So we're ready to go again, Matt? Yeah, hold, let me know if it if it's not changing as I'm clicking around. Um, to Larry's so point about- your gross margin, uh, We see your gross margin chart now, Matt. Is that where you're- Yeah, that's where I'm starting from. Okay, great. 
Um, to, to Larry's point about uh, agri-stability payments not being included in, in other risk um, programs, I think that the, one of the issues there is the, making sure they're recorded in the right period. Often agri-stability payments are coming in the year or two after the crop year, and that really messes with the benchmark numbers. So that's one of the main reasons they're excluded. Um, so you're looking at the gross margin chart here. You can see for this particular farm, um, the line represents the gross, or sorry, the, the bars represent the, uh, the client's gross margin. And in this case, the line represents the average. So you can see that the last number of years, they've been under the average. Now I'm gonna jump back to the summary page here. Did that work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next line here is direct operating expenses. So in there are things like wages, uh, custom work, repairs, and in this farm, you can see this year, they're at $134 an acre and the benchmark was 125. Um, on a five-year average though, they're actually a little bit under the benchmark. So for the most part, they're in line with where we'd expect them to be. This particular year, they had a lot more repairs than the average um, and that drove, drove up their costs, which um, again, you're gonna see um, in, in any particular year, but looking at the average is what you wanna look at. Um, contribution margin, again, we can look at that graph and it's similar in this case to the uh, the gross margin chart. Again, they're, they're not uh, pulling in enough in, in a couple of these years, but on the five-year average, they, they are quite consistent with it. The next one here is, uh, well, we'll skip over overhead expenses as that one's really small and, and they are somewhat higher than the, the benchmark, but in this case, we'll just skip over that. The operating income per acre you can see in this year, they generated 143 and, and the benchmark's 149. Um, on the average, they're at 181 and the benchmark's about 186. So for all intents and purposes, they're, they're, you know, they're producing the crop that is similar to others in the, in the region. Um, you know, they're, they're spending similar amounts on, on wages and repairs. And, and overall, I think things are pointing in a, in a good direction for this farm. That being said, when you look at the next line is where things kind of get out of control. Uh, so capital related costs here are about $100 per acre higher than the average. And when we only have $143 per acre um, from operating income, you know, it, we can't have capital related costs this high. One thing we like to look at is, um, like Larry talked about that EBITDA, um, operating income, I like to look at the average, um, the $181 per acre here. And, you know, basically that tells a farmer, you know, you've got $181 to cover your land rent, your equipment costs and, and uh, interest. We'll dive into this number a bit here. Um, and some of the reasons for that on this farm is, Larry talked a bit about it, but their, their, their equipment fleet, it's, um, one, one thing I like to talk to clients about is, you know, how many acres could you add tomorrow without adding a single piece of equipment? And in this case, the client indicated that it, it was significant. So they've got depreciation or amortization of $105 per acre, and the benchmark is about half of that. Um, we've been using consistent depreciation rates across all of our farms in our region, specifically in the Pemina Valley for many years. So we believe the number to be accurate uh, when we're talking about this $56 per acre. Uh, so we talk specifically about what kind of equipment they have that they're not fully utilizing um, and, and where they could maybe look to add acres uh, if, they, if they're able to find some to rent or, or purchase. In this case, uh, some of these other costs have gotten out of control. Land rent is one that you always gotta look at with in relation to how much land rent is being paid to shareholders because it correlates again when we looked at the direct operating expenses and the salaries expense you know shareholders pay themselves in different ways uh, it could be a combination of land rent salaries and dividends um, so those are numbers that we need to look at and, and take into consideration again these land rent numbers don't represent the market rate of land rent it represents the total land rent the company has paid divided by all of the acres that they're growing in our region, uh, most farms own about 50% of the land that they, they farm and they rent about they rent the other 50%. So this benchmark typically represents about half of the market rate of rent. And in our area, it's between 120, $150 per acre. The company's costs have been escalating 
over the last five years as they've taken on land and restructured. Uh, they've had a lot of landowners um, put their land up for sale and that's driven their interest costs up from $38 an acre five years ago, actually $18 in, in 2016, up to 55 in the current year. And that's quite a bit higher than the benchmark. Um, you know, Larry talked about the benchmark being 1%. And again, it depends on what stage the farm is in. In our region, this isn't an uncommon situation where, you know, landowners are selling land or a state, the state is selling land and, and farmers are put in tough positions as to um, whether or not they want to purchase the land. land. Land prices have been, you know, escalating quickly over the last 10 years. And that's provided, that's put a lot of farms in, in more of a financial uh, stress situation than they have been in the past. So we've seen that benchmark for interest costs rise from $9 in 2016, all the way up to $19 in 2020. And in this case, again, this is the average. So we see farms on the high side of this and the low side. In this case, this farm is at $55 an acre. And that's, you know, I would say it's too high. They need to look at how they can restructure their capital costs. Um, do they need to sell a piece of land that's maybe further away from, from their, their home farm? And uh, maybe they can rent something closer to home or, or you know, make a purchase there. All right. Matt, you just about finished up? You got yeah, some that's, that's really all, all, all that we had here. The, the other income, again, we don't really need to talk about that. But again, looking at the EBITDA and, and how much they have left to cover their payments is, is critical. And this tool really helps us do that. It helps us to project into the future if somebody is looking at purchasing land or, or restructuring their, their operation. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. We've got lots of questions to ask. So really excited to get through some of these. Again, if you want to download the reports, uh, they're coming out in January and the URL is in the chat box. So just so you know, they kind uh, FMC kindly put that in there. Um, okay, well, let's get started here. I, I see quite a few. So why don't I just open it up? Um, so one of the questions was about uh, BC not being involved in the Canadian average. And I'd like Lisa to answer this and talk about the, you know, the evolution of the data and where we're going to go with this and also, um, you know, the consistency of the data. Sure. Um, so yeah, basically we have gradually been bringing in more geographical areas across the country. Um, it's a, an investment in time first. Like Larry said, it's really important that we're comparing apples and apples. So we have to standardize um, standardize the financial statements and then make sure that we have enough operations, like similar operations in, in a given area to, to bring it into our database. So certainly part of our um, plan is, is to roll it out in, in BC and more areas um, as well. Great. Uh, one question that's come in multiple times, and I, I find this really interesting because we've had this discussion, uh, and I was hoping both Matt <clears throat> and Lisa could answer these questions, and, and maybe uh, maybe Larry can voice in. But what is the relationship between the size of the farm and the profitability ratios that Lisa was showing in? So she just sort of alluded to it. So um, that's an interesting question. Lisa, do you want to answer first? Um, yeah, sure. So, so what we have found is that the largest farms aren't, aren't necessarily the most profitable. In fact, they're often not, don't have the highest uh, profitability numbers. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I think uh, to, to that point, what I see is uh, farm management, it, it sometimes gets out of control as, as farms grow and they go from uh, you know, an operation where it's maybe 2,500, 3,500 acres where, you know, father and son or father and daughter can manage the whole operation, um, you know, until acres are added and, and they just can't keep their hands on everything. So they've got to hire, um, you know, hire that farm management piece out or, or pieces of it out. And there's not the attention to detail taken on, on even growing, you know, a really good crop. Um, I've talked with some clients specifically about that and, and how they can improve in, in those situations, but it's, there's definitely a sweet spot um, in our region, the farm that we were looking at there of 3,500 acres, uh, that's kind of in that, what we see in that sweet spot of, of 2,500, 3,500, they're able to farm that with, with one combine, their equipment is, 
is utilized fully. Uh, this was not a great example of that, obviously, but um, yeah. Yeah, and that varies across the country, right? Right. 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 Um, and of course, depends on the on the type of farm as well. Um, so the bell. Can I just add one little yeah. comment to that? And I totally agree with what Matt said. And but my experience is that as you grow your farm, you got to grow your you got to grow your management ability, and lots of people don't, and that's <laughs> where the problem lies sometimes. Yeah, well, well said, Larry. Uh, another question um, from Todd is, how do you treat private insurance claims like premiums from entities like GARS, which is uh, a whole farm insurance program? I think it's I think it's uh, included as revenue and cost, isn't it? In this, in this same categories as crop insurance, I think. Yeah. 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 Should be. That's interesting on the crop insurance discussion um, that we had when it's in revenue in in our area. There was a lot of um, there was a lot of unseeded acres last year, like 2019 uh, crop year, and a lot of crop insurance claims. Um, and when you line it up, it, it really tells you that crop insurance does what it's supposed to, because your mar the margins actually stay very consistent in a year that crop insurance a crop insurance claim uh, was triggered. And I don't uh, I don't see as in Ontario, we don't see those other production insurance programs as much, but I, I expect it's a similar story. Yeah, which is another okay. argument for including it, I think, as, re as yeah, revenue. I Absolutely. Okay, so can a farmer do this kind of analysis themselves, or do you recommend hiring a professional to help with analysis? And what are top farmers doing in this regard? So I think maybe Lisa start with that one, and then we'll move through the group. Can they do it themselves? Uh, so, so yes, I mean, you, you can, you can do it yourself. Um, like the information is Larry's done papers, um, on this. So, so the information is out there. We summer, we put out an annual report publicly with what the, um, benchmarks are, which you, what, what you aren't going to have necessarily is like really specific to your, to your area. Right. So, um, Obviously, different parts of provinces, different regions of provinces are, are going to have different numbers. But to a certain point, yes, you can. And what, and also what we've alluded to a couple of times is a lot of the power in the numbers is actually just looking at your own numbers and, and your own trends. So, of course, you can do that yourself. Um, just reiterating that, you know, the analysis is, is only as good as the information that goes into it, right? So, um, Larry made it sound pretty simple, but there was also there was actually a fair bit of uh, work that went into figuring out where where things belonged um, as far as cost categories and, and what. So, if you're going to compare to those benchmarks, it, it's got to be done consistently and with and with good numbers. But but sure, yeah, you can do your own trend analysis. And sorry, there was a second part of that. Who are top farmers? Top, what are the top farmers doing uh, in this regard? I'm probably not supposed to say come to be there. They all come to BDO, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Good team. answer. <laughs> but, in, but in fairness, I mean, us or not, like top farm managers are using top professionals, right, to to aid them in the management uh, of their farm. I, I would say that's a fair comment. Yeah, but no, nobody else has kind of this amount of data that we've gathered and vetted, and it's, pri it's private and secure and anonymous. So that's giving our clients um, sort of an advantage, I think, right now. Um, I'd like to add one little comment to, to Lisa's first yeah. answer. I think the other, the other reason to have, you know, to have a conversation with a Matt or somebody like that is they've got experience. They've, got, they've seen other farms and so forth. And being able to talk it out with somebody who's, especially if you've got somebody who's got experience and, under, and understands what others are doing, it really helps you. And it, you can only go so far yourself. Uh, I mean, I'm, especially if you happen to be an extrovert and talking, you, you think by talking and that sort of thing, having that third party is kind of useful. Yeah, and our goal is really to get the information presented to you efficiently and, and practically in a way that is useful to you, right? So what's useful to one operation may, may differ than how another yeah. operation wants to. So, so our goal is to get the information you need and help you dig into it the way you need it to, to manage your oper operation. Yeah, to that point, I think, um, you know, often we see farms 
um, surprised by some, maybe some of the per acre numbers that we show them at the end of the year because they're looking at their inputs throughout the year and maybe they're not consolidating that information or they're, it's not tying to their actual accounting records. And, and that, you know, it's so critical that, that when you're doing this analysis that you're using your actual accounting records um, and not just, you know, you know a, a spreadsheet with your input costs on it. Right. Yeah, that may have been given to you by your input supplier, right? You know, yeah. yeah. For, sure. For sure. So in the, there's some questions about the tool itself um, and the deliverable, but it looks like what you saw today was actually what Matt would do with his client. He'd sit down and it's just a plain old spreadsheet. We're hoping to develop it. We want to first be able to get good information, but then maybe make it a little more palatable for people going forward. So that's one of our goals uh, at BDO going forward. We're working on a financial health checkup, uh, which should be out maybe in the next year or so. So we can actually sit down and kind of give everybody an idea of where they are, and then we can dig into some planning with them. So that is, I have another quick question here. We have uh, four minutes and I want each of you to answer this question because I, I think it's, um, it's, it's enlightening. We know that these benchmarks can give us a better picture of our farms. In 10 years, what would you like to see or dream that the egg industry would do with these financial benchmarks? Or you know, how can it change our industry? So I think we start with Larry Martin on this one. Um, well, you know the answer, my, my answer to that question because we've talked about it before, but my, my perception would be, I would, love to, I would love to see a kind of a coalition of accounting firms and others put together a national database. One of the things that we can't do with the BDO one is come up with benchmarks for individual sets of farms because of, you know, their sample size isn't big enough. So as I said before, you can, with a little bit of reflection, you can probably get a pretty good idea about how to change from the basic crop data to, to let's say different types of horticulture and so forth. But it sure would be nice if we had a big enough sample of, uh, uh, potato farms, or uh, and that's that's probably the easy one. Uh, grow crop farms of different types to be able to come up with numbers that we've got them. And I and I think the way to do that is to have a large sample. Um, and it would the more the more information you have, the better it is, as far as I'm concerned. So that's where I'd like to see it go. Matt, how about you? Where would you like to see this go? Yeah, and I, I, I agree with Larry. I also take a little bit of a, of a different approach there and say, I, I think it's going to get, the, the data is going to get better. Um, I really enjoyed Casper's talk on technology and, and, you know, the, I see accounting systems eventually linking in with the data that's coming out of the, the combine or your tractor, uh, how much you're putting down as far as chemical and it going directly into your accounting software so that you can look at these benchmarks in real time. Now we're reviewing these with our clients after their year is already done and, and, and typically their next year is already seeded um, because you know that's when their year end is complete. So there's a little bit of time lag and the relevance um, you know to make decisions on the fly uh, isn't isn't as as there and I think it's, it's going to get there. Um, I'm really excited where technology is going to take um, you know this project. Yep. Good. Lisa do you want to add anything? Um, sure. I, I just think the big win is is having people see power in their financial numbers. So we've talked about that, you know, people often know their production numbers and we really want to create that link um, to help people understand the financial side and what's really driving the profitability of their operation and then use that information um, for business planning and, uh, you know, assessing where you are, where you want to go, where you where you can afford to go, and and how you're going to get there. Um, and then just one other comment I would add uh, quickly as we talk a lot about um, how your operation needs to improve um, and how we use this tool to zone in on areas where where you can do better. Um, I think there's also an opportunity to recognize um, your successes and, and where you are doing well and and doing proud of, and being proud of that. Um, and just really that you know, farm operators put a, put a lot of time and a lot of capital into their business. Um, and they really deserve to be, to be rewarded for what's invested, um, in their business and, and drive their business to be profitable and get a return of, of everything that's invested on a daily basis. That's great. I hope everyone can see my screen now. Uh, Lisa, can you see it? Yep. yep. I'm just going to do a wrap up of some takeaways. Um, the data was from 2019 that Lisa shared. 
Um, so which, which we saw lower margins. And it'll be interesting to see what 2020 is going to bring, especially when we bring in more areas. The data was, uh, you know, from PEI across, including Alberta. Uh, we're going to include hopefully BC, as we mentioned. So looking forward to sort of seeing that that uh, those numbers. But as you know, with this amount of data, it, the, the results are fairly consistent. There's a greater range of profitability within sectors than between sectors. And that's my big takeaway is there's so much room for improvement. I don't know if you remember the, the slide that Lisa show, showed you with the big spread in, uh, in gross margins, for example, and there's just so, so much there. There's also the get good before you get big discussion, which we have we had, and I think was kind of interesting. And as, as we go forward, that will be interesting to see those U-shaped cost curves and, and what that looks like in each sector. And the focus on contribution margin in Western Canada, that's what uh, many of our accountants are finding when they review this, that contribution margin um, is something that really helps our crop farmers in Western Canada and Ontario. So again, the insights reports in January, um, there's uh, four of them that are coming out. First will be Canada's dairy farms, then Western grain and oil seeds, Ontario grain and oil seed, follow the next week by Canada's farm overall and summary of insights. So please uh, don't hesitate to, to download those. Uh, you can register already, as I mentioned, or just go to www.video.ca. And thank you very much. This is our contact. Uh, you can give me a call or email me if you have any questions. So thanks, panelists. Really appreciate it. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks, Heather. <laughs>